Hey, composing gloves here. I'm wearing a hat and today we're going to talk about how to hear compression. Now, this is going to be a little bit of an in-depth video, a lot of theory. Let's get into it because a lot of people, I'm assuming you know what compression is and how it works. I have a couple of videos down in the description explaining what compression is and how it works. I'm not going to explain that. I'm going to talk about it like you know what compression is. Let's talk about some more advanced features of compression so that you can get to hearing it. First off, people compress because of the level you listen at. A lot of people, when they're listening to music, there's one reason, there's actually several more, but I'm not gonna talk about them all. Uh, when you're listening to music in your car, you're gonna be listening at a level of the previous songs you listened to. Then let's say another song comes on and it's slightly softer, people don't like to change the volume of their songs. It also leaves the person psychoacoustically, as we learned with the equal loudness contours and several other things when we talked about the anatomy of the ear, people generally associate louder with better. And it's totally false, it's totally wrong. I'll show you right now because when you do a true comparison of them, you'll notice something. First, I have a compressed version and I have an uncompressed version of Explore the Universe. It's a track I did. And what I do is I need to, com I will compress it to be competitive because that way when my track comes on and it's, the, it's a similar or better level ideally than the person before me, but if it still maintains its clarity and its punch and whatever else I want in that thing, it's largely a, a, an opinion, but whatever else I want in there, uh, then I know I'll be competitive because the users don't have to touch their volume knob and I try to make it sound ideal to the volume they're listening to it at. Now it's really convenient because there's a ceiling. So you mix to the ceiling. Now, I mean, well you master to the ceiling and you try and get that sound really good so that when the user listens, they have that. Now there's up sampling and all this other loads of mumbo jumbo that goes down here, but we're looking at how to hear compression and compression is a huge part of this. Um, so I'm assuming they've also watched previous videos like for example the one on clipping and the different types of clipping We essentially use clipping compression is basically types of soft clipping in a way um, You set a threshold and then you clip whatever passes it essentially But there's different methods of going about it and then up here. We've got our uncompressed version a couple of things We can notice before we do some listening We notice that right here is the loudest part of the track This is also happens to be the most important part of the track or as well as here this is not the loudest part of the track. This whole section down here is the loudest freaking part of the track. And there's a whole another one. Now it is the chorus, which is good. I, I've made a track arrangement wise that allows for something like this. And there, it's also a complicated arrangement, but you notice that we do not have that as extreme a contrast. We do not have the, the most important moment is skewed. And music theory, when you're writing good melodies, one of the first rules you learn is a single focal point. You want one note that is the highest for good singing melodies because that lends itself to a sense of contrast. When you have this, it's, it's going to sound stagnant. It's not as impactful, but ironically, it is, but in not the same way. Ideally, in an ideal world, you will make a perfect mix. And people, I mix to, in this case, I mix to the ceiling, basically. But usually, I'll mix, and I'll be pretty strict about getting it to line up where my peaks hit negative six dB and then everything else below that. So my mixes are actually pretty quiet, but the reason you do that is number one, you have plenty of headroom and digital if you're running 24 bit and I run 32 bit float. So you're totally fine. And the other reason is we can get into like small minute like arguments, but it's pretty much mute. You have plenty of room. And uh, so, and then what I do is I just monitor loud. So I monitor it as if it was sort of like this, but not quite. I have all that contrast. So this sounds a bajillion times better when you monitor it like that. But the problem is no one's going to listen to it at that volume because when the next track comes on, their ears, their speakers are going to blow up. It's going to be so friggin' loud from the next track. So that's, it's just not fair to the user for me to do that unless they're listening to a bunch of my tracks. So I'm thinking about releasing my tracks on my website in this format so that people can listen to them in the ideal best clearest most impactful and artistic setting mastering largely i feel robs the artist in many ways but at the same time it offers a lot of new avenues a lot of people are excited about it because that's like when you're pro that's where like the black magic happens or whatever you know but whatever so we're going to talk about this but anyways that's some of the the reasoning behind why people do this i need my track to sound a particular way when it comes on and uh, my mom listens to my music <laughs> quite a bit, I know. And uh, in the car, she always listens soft, like always. She never listens loud. And it drives me insane sometimes because sometimes it's pretty soft. But it gives me a good sense of how my mix comes across at softer volumes. And so it's just a good thing in some ways, I guess. But uh, let's talk about this. So but yeah, just so you guys know, my mom's my number one fan. I'm not ashamed to say it. So here we've got our mix. And let's talk about compression. So... 
we when you compress something, you know what compression is, and you now you know some of the reasoning behind why why it's there. Let's talk about the characteristics of the way it sounds. So there's this your attack and your release and all that stuff generate an envelope that changes the amplitude. But now you need to ask yourself in your spectrum, is the amplitude that is being when you turn down something, you're not turning down all frequencies evenly. When it only turns down frequencies, a compressor will, unless you have a multiband, in which case it will work in the band setting. But let's say we have a broadband, so a master, one just master band, and signal comes in, and as soon as one frequency passes it and breaks the law, it turns down the whole thing by like such and such. But we have the equal loudness contour curves, and some compressors don't do this. Some are, are fancy smanchy compressors that have other algorithms built in to try and move around this that lend themselves to a particular sound. And so when you think of the whole spectrum moving up and down, you got to be really careful about what you're actually dealing with. A, a lot of these higher-end compressors are higher-end because they have more complicated algorithms to ideally let certain parts run through. A multiband compressor is how you do that. So if one part of the spectrum of, triggers the compressor, other parts are unaffected. And people think that this only happens in multiband compression, but there are designs out there, I'm sure of it, that that's why certain compressors sound a certain way. People spend an awful lot of time fiddling to make compressors like soft tube made emulation compressors. How do they get their sounds? So that's part of it. No, the compressors don't respond equally. They have different ways of turning down the volume, turning it back up, releasing and attacking. There's just, there's just different things about them. So what this means is we're going to get a spectral coloration and it's specific to your compressor. So I can't give you a, a in-depth thing. What you need to do is you need to run sound through your compressor, uncompressed, and then compressed because your compressor may be doing stuff with it just off. I believe the Fairchild does that. And you, you also want to try it at a variety of settings at a very sort of a hard, a hard uh, limiter, basically. And then a soft knee, hard knee. You want to try it at, you know, just this is a basic limiter. You try it at a variety of settings. My, this one has saturation enabled. And we've, we've talked about these things. If you watch my Fruity Limiter video on the FL12 effects. So all these things are considerations you need to take in or are things you should be looking for. So we're looking for general amplitude changes. Generally, high frequencies tend to rise up in these things. There are softer components in the sound, but most compressors will bring those up with your sound. My voice right now is heavily compressed. Um, I'm not, it's, it's whatever. It's a, it's a ge pretty general setting just so that I can run my signal in here and it hits a compressor and it brings it up and I'm happy with the way my voice sounds in my videos. So I'm good to go there. Now we see here that we have this and then we have this and the question becomes, is this equal to this? And the answer is obviously no, there is new frequency content here. It literally has a different spectral sound. So set your volume one more time to this. I don't believe we did set our volume. So when you're listening, because of that hole, you want to listen to a particular volume. We have to pick a level to listen to these things at. And it's an unfair thing to really do to you, especially over YouTube, because YouTube will also compress and do things to my audio for streaming purposes. It's not the full high fidelity. So you're only going to get a piece of the action. If you really want the full action, you have to make a mix yourself. So I mix to negative six usually, but again, I, I gave myself a moment to shine here. And um, in my break core video, I actually don't master like this because I felt like it was sacrificing some of what I was doing. So I just didn't master it. There are actually a lot of old songs I didn't master that and so a lot of ways sound louder than this, but however, they have frequency problems. My older, my older stuff before I understood a lot of this stuff, they have a lot of frequency problems. So, because I didn't understand other things that compression could, could do for you and by way of control. So this is like going to be a blatant example and then we'll look at something a little more specific. So I'm going to play it. You're going to have to listen to it at the volume. I want you to set your volume for the louder one and then just sort of deal with the softer one being softer. Just know that there's much more contrast. We're listening for, I want you to try and listen to spectral changes and try and use your conscious awareness of the equal loudness contours uh, to make up the difference in your mind. So here we go. So this is right before the drop and this is the Explorer Universe. Use this to set your volume. <laughs> So that that jives like that's great. I really like that. I can hear everything. It it's not it doesn't spike me. I definitely get poked with some sharp objects 
when I when I hear my stuff, well, because unfortunately that's just the way it is. But yeah. Anyways, for all the reasons I explained before, I just know that I could pump my volume. So you've set your volume. If you you listen to that, there's a lot going on. I've got bass. It's eating a lot of stuff, a lot of headroom too. So that was kind of a challenge with that track. But here's the other one. Now I want you to listen to just the, the contrast, and then we're gonna go A B a little bit, and you listen to the harmonic content in each one and be like oh this one sounds like it has more highs or less lows or whatever because it's more than a volume change this volume change is like a dynamic spectral moving change so uh here's so okay let's a b it a bit and try to make conscious realizations about a mu as much of it as you can Here's the other one. Explore the unit. So you see how it loses. I'm gonna. That's all I'm gonna do. You see how it loses its definition, its punch, its clarity right there. But it's still sort of there, and that's enough to live with. But it, it, at a lower volume, that'll that'll pop through or whatever volume people are listening to it at that'll that'll pop through a lot more than this will but this will have this will be more of an experience than this one will be um something else uh that occurred to me while we were listening to it let's just do it one more time give you another chance to a b it <laughs> So hopefully you've gained some stuff from that. You've, you've learned a little bit of what how compression sort of sounds. Another thing that you need to be aware of when you're touching your compressor is it can throw off your stereo image in a mix. So if you've mixed something so that, you know, it sounds like it's over here and like this side's, you know, got some other content in it, and but you've panned it a little bit. And then later on through the magic of masking, which we've talked about, you compress things up. Well, it could actually cause this, some of it's been compressed so hard that it's actually brought this one up in comparison, actually shifted your stereo mix over a little bit. Um, you'd be surprised, and sometimes it can go the other way, but a lot of ma mastering engineers are aware of all these issues. They have that finely trained ear. They're able to pick out these subtleties. Well, in this case, I honestly, I don't think it's that subtle sometimes. But anyways, they can do that. And like, for example, I have to be really cautious about high-end and mid-range stuff because that stuff tends to come through and hurt to listen to. So you have to be aware of that. You have to be aware of, uh, I'll do a small high cut sometimes. Sometimes I do a boost that they listen to the low end a lot. They have a lot of, well, they, you should have a lot of experience in listening to these various areas of the spectrum and understanding the various issues with your knowledge of combination tones and beat frequencies and all these things. You should be really hyper aware of what sort of an impact you could have on a mix. And you give it that extra little bit of sparkle. And also, you can put it through a mastering process and it sounds, you know, okay on the other end. It doesn't, you, these two things are never going to sound the same and far, as far as clarity goes. They just can't. This is just a totally different beast. So, yeah, so let's talk about compression on something that's maybe not a full mix. So we're going to talk about hearing compression just a little bit more. Let's say that we have a harmer line, right? It sounds like this. And I'm going to move these over there. Cool. It's the reverb thing that we did. Okay, let's go to pattern six and drop that on there. Do, 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 do. So we have this, and let me go on and turn the reverb off. Um, oh, yeah, there's a Maximus on here, but it's not doing anything, and it's on linear phase, so it didn't color our signal. Okay, so we'll turn our, re our convolver off. What was convolution reverb? All right, that's what it sounds like. Now let's look at how it will sound compressed. And we already know... Oh, I, I saw a weird shadow, and then I realized it was my dog. Okay, uh, let's put... Uh, let's stick out just a regular compressor. Now let's do Maximus. Okay, I'm going to go linear phase just for extra high quality. So if we run it through, that's what it sounds like with, with without...
So you see, it does color our signal actually a little bit. Wow. It does. There's a, there's a difference there. Okay, so let's go to master, and we're going to turn these ones compression off, compression off, compression off. And so basically right now, it's just a compressor, and I have videos in my maximums from the ground up if you're curious, but I'm going to set my threshold down here. Basically, we're just going to use clipping essentially to limit the dynamic range. And something that can turn down the dynamic range and sound really transparent is we refer to as a transparent uh, compressor. Shocker, right? So it sounds it sounds like it's not there, but it achieves the dynamic compression that we want. If you want, you can go check out my FL12 effects fruity limiter. I talk about that later. It's sort of in the middle, and it's a pretty long tutorial because I'm going over limiters in, in pretty detail. But anyways, we're turning down our volume. And uh, let's uh, turn this up. So without the compression, it sounded like this. If we turn it down, we get this. Now you notice we could see that there is a small spike right here. The purple represents the input signal. The white represents, in this case, essentially the output. The output's actually green, but where the purple and the green overlap turns white. So we see that we have this small little spike right here. That is the, the compressor activating. We can make it faster by going over to attack. Or actually the, the compressor on the master band is a little bit special because if we do this, let it play it looks ahead and actually delays our signal. So this is actually a look ahead limiter, essentially is what the master band is. So let's um, yeah, let's get a regular compressor. We'll just get the fruity compressor, something really simple. So we're gonna put our threshold really freaking low. And uh, turn our ratio up, because you have to have a ratio. We'll compress it 30 to one. So right now it's a limiter. So you see that initial clip from when it hits. The reason I had to change is because it's a look ahead limiter. You can go watch my Maximus series if you're curious about that. But you hear, that's what compression sounds like. And then the idea is then you just pump it up after. So we apply some makeup game. So it's been it's taken the, the low end. It's turned down things that pass the threshold by such and such an amount, giving it a spectral change. And then so that squashes it. And then you take your low and your mid range, you take that squash thing and you turn it up. Now on average, it is louder. Cause if you remember our ears, listen and hear and judge loudness over a sustained period of time. However, what we just did is we also took away our transients, which takes away as we learned about transients in the earlier videos in this series. We also learned that transients are maintain different characters when they get past a certain volume because they happen too fast. So we'll apply some makeup game. So you see how different that sounds versus. And some people want that. It's a great way to sort of do sound design and sound shaping, but that is one way it can sound. Now, if we turn our compressor and make it sound slow, check this out, it sounds way different. So without compressor with a slower attack. And now, of course, we have an enormous amount of makeup game. We wouldn't do that. We put up only some in makeup game. So it's kind of an interesting deal. Now we, we get into something also called pumping. And what we're gonna do, it's not side chaining. I'm not gonna go over side chaining. You can extrapolate all the side chaining from all this stuff. You got the, the changes and stuff. You should also remember that this also will change your beats and your combination tones. So th those pretty much never go away once, once we talked about them. Uh, and let's go to, let's just find a, I have a Sony folder. Oh, you know what? Uh, let's go to Sony. And loops and songs, loops and songs, songs. Oh, they don't give me songs. We'll just go to loops. We'll get a bass loop. Chapman stick. There we go. So we have this bass loop. And we'll loop it a bunch of times. And we're going to compress this. Compressing bass, uh, usually do this. In, uh, so one thing you could do is you could route this thing out two channels. So you have one version that has your transient. So your initial impact is there. And then you have another version that's really highly compressed. And then you mix in the compressed one according to the level that is necessary to get the consistency of level you want. So you get that perceived loudness. That's another compressed sound. However, you're mixing it in, which means it's going to sum with this guy, which means this is going to change slightly. 
or, or very drastically, depending on what you do. It'll oftentimes add frequency content, higher frequencies usually. So uh, let's uh, put on a Maximus, or not a Maximus, because we, it's a look ahead deal. We just want a normal one. Fruity compressor, uh, there we go. And we'll put the threshold pretty low. Some people will, and then we'll turn on our ratio pretty high. So you hear it going, and people will then dial it back. Maybe like five to one or whatever. So you get a couple more dB of headroom, so it just sounds that much louder. Because you generally don't want to make this, you don't want to pull this sort of stuff up, which is where a multiband compressor will come in handy. So we have this, and then what we're going to do is we're going to bring our threshold up just a little bit, so we only get sort of these peaks. And then we'll apply some gain. And you just get a more a more even sound. There, a lot of times these things are pretty subtle. People who really know about compression will say that it's, well, I don't know. Maybe you consider yourself, you know a lot about compression. You wouldn't say this. But I say this, and I believe people who really do know what they're saying say this. The compression, oftentimes, if you're going for a mixing perspective, it will change the way a sound feels. It won't change the way a sound sounds. So that's sort of the goal. Of course, it changes the way it sounds, but that's not your principal objective. It's like a mindset. So we have that. Now let's do a multiband compression. Now there's a couple of different ones that are sort of interesting. You have something called uh, Maximus, and I have a whole series on this. But basically, that high this this is going to be mostly high, and I can tell because there's all that line. It's like basically filled in. That's really high frequency information. Where we want to get to this stuff, which is going to be mostly living in our mids and our our lows. And if we open up Maximus, we can actually solo the different bands. So there's the high. We could even bring that down. And then we go to our mids. That's what we want. And then our lows. So now we can have an event in the lows trigger compression and only compress the lows against the highs. However, you'll notice something that's kind of interesting. If we take this and blow up the these, this first area, when the frequencies are of a, of a dynamic level right here, um, and then they get a louder, you'll notice that the very first frequencies, even in the low frequencies, We get this interesting. Now, this is part. This is also because of the shape I'm doing. But you'll get these click sounds, and in the in the mids, you'll oftentimes get a lot of noise still too. See, that's where a lot of the the mid range noise lives. A lot of people think it's only high end, and it's noise actually. What we typically associate with it actually goes down in the mid range quite a ways. So, uh, you want to be aware of those things when you're doing it. But now we can compress the, these ranges and apply makeup gain to them. Take the solo off. And augment the frequency content. Now I am. I'm only showing you one version, okay? There you could do like you could do soft, you could be really subtle about it. I'm doing pretty extreme things so that it's obvious what I'm doing. Um, yeah, so you do soft, you can do low, you can do high, low knee. You can also do really weird stuff where you actually expand. Uh, and then you compress, like I expand these frequencies, but then I compress anything past here. That's weird. Uh, so that's Maximus. Another option you have that I think is a really great visualizer is TDR Nova. And it should be right there. So this is TDR Nova. And what you can do in TDR Nova is you can take a, we'll put analyzer in or out. So we have frequency content here, and then we can use each of these bands, and we can set a threshold. Um, if we turn, go to band one and turn on our threshold, and then we can set a threshold, which is represented by this blue line, and you can actually compress these frequencies when they pass this threshold, and it will be visually represented by this thing going down, by this yellow line. So right now we're at a ratio of, of two to four. So this is without it. See, it sounds actually a bit more thin. But then what you do is this thing also has an EQ gain. So you can hear what it does is it brings it back to the volume level that it was at. I believe it uses an RMS value to do this. So it'll make up the value and gain that you lost. So basically, instead of like turning this down, it turns everything else. Well, in this case, if you were to boost, it would turn everything else down. Um, I'm not sure about the cut actually with the compressor. I know it works for, I believe it actually may only work for the EQ. 
So it's responsive to the EQ. So it'll mirror the image. So this is going down. Um, with cuts, I believe it doesn't do anything. But when you do a gain, instead of making this go up, it'll make this flat and we'll cut these over here. Not like that. It'll mirror the image though. It's called EQ gain. So I believe it's only gain. But anyways, that's a really, really nifty feature for just judging content. Are you really making a difference or are you just changing the volume of something? But that can also make a difference as, we, as we've learned throughout this series as well. It may be the effect you're going after. A lot of people say, oh no, because of this, that, or the other. But if it makes an effect that's pleasing to you and you know what you're doing, you're well within your rights to do whatever the junk you want then. As long, who cares about the method? I care about, you know, did you get the result that you wanted? So we see we're applying quite a heavy amount of gain in addition to our cut already because it's passing this line. Because it uses the input. I, I don't know the, the order that this happens in, but it appears to be happening. The threshold happens after before the cut. So when you cut, you get the gain plus the cut's actual gain. And so we could turn down the, the threshold even lower. And then it like removes it totally. So anyways, you're basically, when you're listening for compression, those are some of the things you should listen for. But then we could apply some output gain. And that's say, oh, we don't like that. We'll just cut that out. Or you know what? We will uh, compress it out. So we'll turn on the threshold for that band and we'll compress it. And then I like now we've we've essentially taken that out. Well, we probably want to compress out of the way or those things. And some people will use this for uh, de-essing. So there's a particular area of the voice that you know the the sibilance of the voice. And what you'll do is you'll put a compressor that compresses only the sibilance, so it doesn't get rid of the frequencies. It just turns them down when they get too loud. And then you won't apply any makeup gain to that. So hearing compression is a combination of just working with compression a lot and just being aware of the reasons why you use compression. And you want to keep your transients intact because if you take out this transient here, you're going to make it sound a lot more dull than before because you're turning up the rest of it. So there's no contrast. There's no moment of impact. And if this gets turned down, which sometimes the compressor can't react fast enough, so compressors are tend to either pump or leave clicks because it turns down and then back up and then down and then back up. And that creates this pumping effect. Or you could use side chaining to deliberately create a pumping effect. But anyways, hopefully this has shed some light on how you can hear compression, ways of hearing compression, why compression is used, because it's a subject that's like covered in, in mystery because there's so many ways to use it. There's a lot of ideas about when to use it and why to use it. And the, the ideas that are there about when to use it and why to use it um, are oftentimes also covered in opinions because it's, is it a sound that you like? And there's different tools, like there's a, this is a dynamic EQ, which this is a free plugin, by the way, I covered in my free plugins video versus a multiband compressor like this, which is also a multiband expander, which if you get the gentleman's edition of this, because I have the standard one, you actually get that as well. Um, but here you get that, you get a multiband expander and just you get this look ahead feature and just a whole bunch of other things. And then you have just regular compressors, which just look pretty much like that. So there's just a load of additional tools that makes it a little confusing. Another thing about compressors, I guess I'm just going to cover uh, gates real quick too. Hearing gates is essentially the same way, only if you, you, I'm assuming you know how a gate works. If you don't, go watch the fruity limiter video because I have a gate, it has a gate in it. And what you do is you set a threshold once again, but then you turn down the volume by a certain by a certain amount. And it also has an attack and a release, but all we have here is a release. And so this will also impart it in the same way that a compressor will impart its sound to a particular thing. And what you need to do to hear compressors first, you listen to what that sounds like with it by itself, with it, with it on its default setting when signal is just going through it. Then you experiment with the different ways to learn how that compressor sounds. If you're serious about learning what compression sounds like, that's what you're going to do. And then when you hear things like, like all the tss or the mouth movements of someone's mouth or whatever, and then they compress it in an untasteful way. You'll hear, you'll be like, oh, that sounds so compressed. Or you hear a guitar that just sounds loud all the time and never gets any softer, even though you know that that part should be getting softer. And what they've used is either arrangement or timbral cues to tell you how something should be. But it just sounds loud all the time. You're like, dang, that thing was freaking compressed hard. Or maybe they compressed it and didn't turn it back up to get a particular effect or vibe. So it's really just a really, really interesting things. 
Um, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. There's there's more. I could talk for a long time about this, but it's like a lot of just you experimenting and getting your own feel for it. Subscribe, support me on Patreon, and have a blessed day. Thank <laughs> you.